Next up is Dr. Ken Sikaris, and he's going to speak to us about the effects of digestible carbohydrates and the importance of indigestible carbohydrates, also known as prebiotics or resistant starches, uh, and the impact on gut flora. So Dr. Ken Sikaris is the head of chemical pathology uh, right here at Melbourne Pathology. He's a senior fellow of St. Vincent's Clinical School and a clinical associate in biochemistry at the University of Melbourne. Ken has particular interest in diabetes, PSA testing, lipid testing, uh, and interpretation as well as quality assurance. Part of his work involves discussing the significance of pathology tests with doctors. Uh, he has presented extensively at national and international symposiums. He's even featured act actually in Jimmy Moore's uh, book Cholesterol Clarity, which is a great one to have a look at. We also um, interviewed Jimmy Moore on the Primal Shift, uh, and that certainly comes up in the episode. He's also a really great friend of the Melbourne Paleo Meetup Group. And once again, please welcome Dr. Ken Sakaris. Thank you. So when um, Z and Charby asked me to talk about something, I wanted to choose something I knew very little about. So. I'm a bit selfish in that way, but uh, I've hoped my selfishness is balanced by this sharing of what I've found. And um, and there's a lot of science in it, a lot of graphs. Don't get too worried about it. If you're interested in it, it's all there. But just think about the ideas that come with these um, images. So what I'm going to talk about is sugars and starches, the hydrogen breath test, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, the FODMAPs, these other um, non-digestible carbs, and the gut flora, which is the bacteria in our gut. So sugars are you know, characterised by sweetness, and so you've got fructose at the top end of the sweetness scale and galactose at the bottom end. And when you combine different types, they change in sweetness. Now, without telling you what that molecule is, which is a mixture of galactose and fructose, how sweet do you expect it would be? So it's going to be sweet. It's about as sweet as glucose, but not quite as sweet as fructose because it's got the galactose balancing it. We'll come back to that molecule soon. So it doesn't matter whether those sugars are one by one or two by two. The body should be able to break down all the two by twos with uh, pr uh, disaccharidases. And we've had lactase, maltase, sucrase, we can break down all the two by two sugars. So we've got the monosaccharides, those individual sugars, or the disaccharides, which we can break down with these enzymes that we should have in our gut. And then we've got glucose, which is lots and lots joined together, not two, like hundreds or even thousands. And they're starches or fibre, and we'll discuss the various types of those. So plants make carbohydrate from the energy of the sun, they can't store it in water because it sucks water in, so they join it together and make starch. And that's what starch looks like when the seeds and the grains store it, little packets of carbohydrate. And it doesn't really matter what sort of plant it is, it stores it as a granule. But those granules are made up of these chains of sugar, hundreds of thousands of sugars joined together. Now we have an enzyme called amylase that we produce in our mouth and in our pancreas which breaks down those long chains of starch to individual <laughs> glucose molecules. But the only problem is we have troubles when, with um, molecules when they branch. We don't know how to break down those branches. Now plants obviously do because that's why they put them there so that bacteria and animals can't get easily at those um, carbs. And bacteria have also worked out how to break down those branches. So when we use amylase, there's the starch granules. They start off, then by the time they've gone through your mouth, the start of the breaking down of the granule has occurred with your salivary amylase. And then once you get into the gut and the heavy-duty pancreatic amylase and some other um, sugars, get, then you start breaking down all that starch and you make the starch sugar. And so it doesn't really matter whether you have the sugar as sugar or as potato starch, your glucose level will go up the same way. It's carbs. 
There are some starches, though, which are more resistant, like some strains of rice or wholemeal bread, which release the starch more slowly. And so you don't get as rapid a rise in glucose and you don't get as rapid a rise in insulin. So this is the story normally. It doesn't matter what sugar comes in. It's all broken down and absorbed into the body. And we've got these enzymes. We'll break down the disaccharides. And then you absorb the sugars either through a glucose galactose transporter or this fructose transporter. And then at the other end, it's all the same transporter. So we talk about all these GLUT transporters and the ones that are important in the gut are the GLUT2 and the GLUT5. The GLUT5 particularly for um, fructose. Fructose relies on the activity of that GLUT5 transporter. So now what we do, we can do in the laboratory is this hydrogen breath test. The idea in the hydrogen breath test is that if you don't absorb the sugar you've got a whole lot of hungry bacteria in your large bowel who will eat it. And when they eat it, they make hydrogen. And when you make hydrogen in the gut, hydrogen can cross the body, it can get into the body, into your lungs, out, and out in your breath. So we can look in your breath for hydrogen and we know it's there because the bacteria in your gut has broken down some sugar. Now, there is one... Uh, we do this hydrogen breath test here, but um, I'm not sure how many people in Melbourne have started to doing a more sophisticated breath test because some people have a bacteria that use hydrogen and they convert the hydrogen to methane. So if you've got a lot of that bacteria, you won't actually produce hydrogen in your breath, you'll be producing methane in your breath. And this is the bacteria thought to be the most um, common cause, Methanobrevibacter. And, um, and that's what it looks like, pretty cute little bacteria. And it takes up hydrogen and converts it to methane. Um, this is just some you know, studies of, well, how many people do have that bacteria, the, the methanogenic bacteria? And generally, it's somewhere around 30 to 40% in different studies. So about one-third of us will have that methane-generating bacteria in our gut. Um, and it, and you can, it's higher in Africa, and it's more common in women than men, and you know, common in different age groups. So there are some things about this bacteria we're still trying to find out. Now, the worrying thing is, is it good or bad to have this bacteria? Um, we generally find that people that have both hydrogen and methane production are more likely to have fructose and lactose intolerance. So it could be that if you've got this bacteria, you're more vulnerable to non-digested carbohydrates. But this one, this study was even more worrying. The people that produce both methane and hydrogen are likely to have a higher BMI. They tend to be more overweight. So the methane-producing bacteria is not just an interesting biological fact. It may have some importance clinically, both in the expression of irritable bowel syndrome as well as um, chronic diseases like obesity and diabetes. So here's the hydrogen breath test. So the bac you eat the sugar. If it gets to the large bowel, the bacteria will produce hydrogen or methane. It will go into your blood and then out through your lungs. So I'm going to show you a few results. Now, we know how to break down every disaccharide except one. There's a disaccharide that I haven't described there. Which, what, which coupling of disaccharides haven't I described there? Galactose and fructose. Nature doesn't combine galactose and fructose. Galactose to do with milk and fructose to do with trees and plants. So when you have a breastfeeding plant, you might find <laughs> it doesn't occur in nature, lactulose. It's a man-made chemical of a, of a joining together of galactose and fructose, and we don't know how to break it apart. And so when we eat it, it all goes to the large bowel, and it creates a bit of havoc, and that's why it's a good laxative. If you have too much of it, it'll cause diarrhoea. 
Now, some people say it's prebiotic because it's going to change your bowel flora somehow. So what, what we normally see when we give gal, uh, lactulose, which is this undigestible sugar, is about 60 to 90 minutes when that sugar hits the large bowel, hydrogen's produced. This is the normal response to lactulose. This is what we should see. And it doesn't really... The interesting thing is, um, you'd say this patient probably felt sick. You can't tell from the hydrogen levels whether this patient's feeling sick or not. The hydrogen level doesn't correlate with their symptoms. So you can get a patient with higher hydrogen levels than this patient, like into the 50s and 60s, with no symptoms whatsoever. So it's not all just to do with a bacteria and how much carbohydrate they get to. It's, there are other factors which determine symptoms. So this is a lactulose breath test and at about 120 minutes we find that everyone produces some hydrogen and most people produce more than 20 parts per million. Now what about lactose intolerance? So this is the galactose glucose, the milk, the sh sugar in milk, so some people can't break that down. Um, it's very common after an infection, particularly in children, that you lose that ability and that's why we say don't give dairy to people with after, you know, gastro or after gastro because that, bacteria, that enzyme's not working very well. Um, and it's quite normal for adults not to have much of this. It's very normal in Asian and African populations to have very low levels of lactase. But in Northern Europeans, we've got a mutation which allows us to have plenty of lactase. And so most Caucasians don't have a problem with lactose intolerance because they've got a mutation which gives them an extra capacity to get rid of lactose. So this is what should happen with um, most Caucasians. You give lactose and even after 120 minutes, there's nothing in, none of it's got to the large bowel. There's no bacterial production of hydrogen. Whereas this patient here has got, you know, about an hour into it, she's producing masses of amount of hydrogen. The lactose has got to the large bowel she's very likely to be symptomatic. But not always, again, a bit like the lactulose. Just because you've got hydrogen doesn't necessarily prove that you've got an intolerance. And we find, and we've done thousands of these now, we find in Australia about 30 to 40% of everyone we test has lactose malabsorption or intolerance, mainly Asians and you know, non-Northern Europeans. Now, what about this patient here? As soon as the lactose hit their mouth, they were producing hydrogen. And when it got to the large bowel, there wasn't any hydrogen being produced. So what does that mean? Does it mean that the bacteria in the upper gut, what are they doing there? They've chewed up all this sugar and there's none left for the bacteria in the lower gut? What, what does this mean? And this one's even more interesting. It was only produced at the beginning. This patient also had fructose malabsorption, just a bit of a hint about what might be going on here. She had another problem. And this is something that Peter Gibson has said, that the problem is when you malabsorb a sugar and you're feeding those bacteria, they can thrive, and they can thrive and spread from the, low, the large bowel, the lower part of the bowel, to the upper part of the bowel. And that's a problem now because you feel sick as soon as you eat that sugar rather than after an hour or two. Now fructose is a monosaccharide, a single saccharide, and it's not, we don't have to break it to absorb it, but we need that GLUT5 transporter to absorb it. And some people have quite an active GLUT5 transporter and some don't. So here's that um, transporter. Now, if that transporter's uh, not working very well, well, you can sort of hurry it along by taking the glucose, fructose with glucose because it switches on this part of the transport and sort of pulls the fructose through. 
But if you give fructose alone, it's not relying on this co-transport with glucose. Let's have a look at some uh, results. So here's a normal patient, fructose given, it's all absorbed, good GLUT5 transporter, none of it gets to the large bowel, no, no hydrogen production. This patient, terrible GLUT5 transporter. We give fructose, they can't absorb it at all, massive hydrogen production as soon as it hits the large bowel. And so what we find, where is lactose malabsorption is 30 to 40% of the population, fructose is more like... Um, it's a little bit higher, about 40 to 50 per cent. And here's another one of these patients. They're sort of producing it very early on, before the fructose had a chance to be absorbed. And here's one of those other patients that's only producing the fructose in the, la in the small bowel. So like the previous thing, now this patient there had lactose malabsorption. This patient because they're taking lactose, that have encouraged all this bacterial overgrowth in their gut, now when they take fructose, the bacteria are up in the small bowel waiting for any sugar that comes along. And what we find generally, it doesn't matter what the symptom is, they're just as likely to be lactose intolerance as fructose intolerance. And not only that, just like this patient, the patient that I showed you with fructose intolerance, that's their lactose curve. But this patient, that's their main problem. They can't absorb lactose and there's bacteria running amok with lactose. But when they get the fructose, um, it creates a problem. Now here is sort of irritable bowel patients and they're much more likely to have problems with lactose and sorbitol, or lactose and fructose and sorbitol, you know, a mixture of sugars. Not one sugar that causes a problem, it's all the sugars that cause a problem. Because their issue isn't so much the sugar, it's the response to the sugar, which is the bacterial overgrowth. Okay, now, so small bacterial overgrowth, how do we define it? So how do we work out? Well, you can technically you know, get some stuff from the small bowel, some fluid, and grow bacteria and see how many there are. But in the past, we were only interested in small bacterial overgrowth in patients that we operated on and did terrible things to their bowel. And we created a criteria which was, if it was more than 10,000 bacteria colonies per mil of fluid in the... We said that was bad. But that's in surgical patients. In healthy people, they seldom get above 1,000 bacteria per mill of small bowel fluid. So the definitions of small bowel, small intestinal bowel bacterial overgrowth are also changing with time. As we discover, it doesn't only occur in patients we've operated on. It occurs with patients who are eating too much carbohydrate. So we know that that bacteria... So, so normally the small bowel stays pretty clean because there's lots of fluid. Every day your body produces about 10 litres of digestive fluid into your stomach and your small bowel, plus all the enzymes. It's flushing it through. If you slow things down, the bacteria can st settle there. It's a nice, peaceful place to live. Um, but it's the biggest part of it is this large intestinal expansion into the small bowel. That's what the main problem is with um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. So the problem is the bacteria will digest the carbohydrates, so you get that hydrogen and gas production and feeling terrible. Um, it'll produce fatty acids, it'll produce things which may damage the gut, and it, it also affects the, all those digestive things you're putting out. It may destroy them. And so people, we need bile salts which are produced by the liver to digest fat, but if the bacteria get to the bile salts, then you won't be able to absorb fat either. I'll show you a bit of that later. So uh, small bacterial overgrowth. So, so normally we see, normally in Australia, we see about 20% of people without any symptoms whatsoever have small bacterial overgrowth. Whereas in disease, it's more like 30 to 50% that will have it. And there are people trying to work out how to treat it. Um, 
do you give it an antibiotic which is not absorbed into the body or do you change the diet, which is probably more logical. Now we're getting on to this um, issue of FODMAPs and the, and the things that we can't digest and the clinical problems that occur. So this is Peter Gibson from Box Hill and he's championed that cause. I've put the trademark there because FODMAP is owned by Peter Gibson. Um, I sort of hope, like the glycemic index, it doesn't become too self-focused and it does have a general purpose, but there was a logic to it. So when he, when he describes what are these FODMAPs, are the fermentable oligosaccharides and polyols, he says they're fructans, they're galactans, they're lactose and fructose, and they're things like sorbitol and mannitol. So these form three groups. Lactose and fructose we've covered. The other things that are um, FODMAPs get covered by three groups. Fructose and lactose we've covered. Fructans, galactans and polyols. They're very simple to understand the difference between them. Now, first of all, I want to measure cellulose. There is a barrier for humans. Humans cannot break down cellulose. Bacteria are ingenious at breaking down cellulose, and we're trying to work out how to use bacteria to convert wood to sugar. That would be really neat, as if we need any more sugar. <laughs> but uh, cellulose will just go through us. We don't know how to break that down. Now, here's some other polysaccharides uh, that we can't break down. So if you link together fructose units, we don't know how to break it down. That's what fructans are. And we need, and there's two types. They're, now fructans are another way that, that plants can use to store energy because they know that animals don't know how to break it down so they probably won't eat this stuff. Um, so leavens and insulins, rather than being the structure of, this, of the plant, like the cellulose, this is a storage product of the cell, of the plant cell. And we don't have any fructanases, but plants, yes, yeasts and bacteria do. And these are some bacteria in, that normally exist in the gut that can break down fructans. So if we don't absorb them in our large bowel, they'll get to the large bowel. If we've got these bacteria, it's party time again. We'll make some hydrogen. So it's in many, and this, these are the things that are in artichokes and garlic and asparagus and the thing that cause problems for onion eaters. If you have too much, you'll get indigestion or diarrhea. Galactans, the other category. This is when galactose is joined together in chains. We don't know how to break down galactose chains. Um, and legumes have this. Legumes are the uh, plant the most. And then lastly, polyols. Polyols are a type of sugar that can't be broken down by us. It's sort of an open chain sugar rather than ring sugar. It's got lots of hydroxyl groups. The ones that we're mainly interested in is sorbitol, mannitol and xylitol. Sorbitol is very common in fruit and mannitol and xylitol that uses artificial sweeteners, but they're fairly rare in the diet. But sorbitol, you do, you, you can be exposed to. And we can't break these down either. So the whole thing with breath tests, now I've said with the breath tests, some people have hydrogen production and no symptoms. So it's not just the bacteria, there are other effects too. If the gas makes your large bowel expand and then your there's a neural message to your body says there's something terrible in your gut, get rid of it. You'll have you know, that's what might cause diarrhea in some people. Whereas other people will tolerate that stretching by hydrogen. Now we don't use the breath test for fructans and gluc uh, the glucans or, or mannitol because the fructans and glucosans you can't absorb anyway. There's no point doing a test to see whether you can. You can't absorb it. And if you want to work out if there's upper, upper GI overgrowth, well, you just use lactose or fructose. 
And mannitol you could test for, but it's very rare that that's the cause of a problem in an irritable bowel patient. And if it is, just give them some mannitol and you'll soon find out. Okay, so here's the, um, the FODMAPs, fructans. Here's fructose. Remember, that with the fructose, um, if you give fructose on its own, 30 to 40% of people generate hydrogen. If you give fructan on its own, healthy people will generate hydrogen. If you give fructose with glucose, which helps you absorb the fructose, less hydrogen production in healthy people because you've, you can facilitate that GLUT5 transport. This is the effect of these um, sugars on small bowel water. How much water is in your small bowel? When you get fructose, if you can't absorb it, all this sugar is sitting in your small bowel and sucking water into the small bowel. And so you get a distension of the small bowel with fluid. And that's uncomfortable, that's distension. But look at the fructan, that doesn't cause that osmotic effect in the small bowel. And not even in the large bowel. Because you don't usually have much of it, but it, the bacteria don't metabolise it as quickly as they do fructose. So there's a differential effect between fructose and gas, fructans and gas, but fructose has this water effect as well, which makes it worse. But both of them will generate gas at the other end, and uh, we can see that gas, whether you have um, fructose or fructans, you'll see increased gas in the large bowel. Okay, now, um, dietary fibre. Fibre is such a loosely used term. What is it? It's an edible part of a plant that's resistant to a digestion. It promotes uh, diarrhoea, reduces cholesterol. We don't know. We just try to work out what it is by describing it. And there's other definitions of fibre. You know, well, it's from plants. Or, well, it's chemically, it's joined like this. Well, digestively, we can't absorb it. How do we measure it? Fibre is just a really loose term for non-digestible starch. Here's uh, some hydrogen breath tests. So remember I said this is a patient who's been given a high FODMAP diet, high fructans, high um, polyols. They're healthy. You give them these things, they can't absorb them. So after three or four hours, up, go, up goes the hydrogen production as it's sitting in the large bowel. But they don't have any symptoms. They're healthy. This is a normal part of digestion. But if you've got a patient with irritable bowel syndrome and you give them the FODMAPs, not only does the hydrogen rise earlier because of the small bacterial overgrowth, but the number of bacteria in the large bowel are even higher as well, and so they get this massive hydrogen production. So it's best not to have a high FODMAP diet if you're symptomatic. Does it make any difference to a healthy person, a low FODMAP diet, to remove all of those things? There's no hydrogen production. They feel okay, but they felt okay anyway. But if you give a low FODMAP diet to a patient with irritable bowel syndrome, and now there's not any of those non-digestible sugars for the bacteria to run amok with, no hydrogen production, just like a healthy patient. So it's, it sort of shows that it's all to do with the fermentation of these non-digestibles rather than anything to do with... Um, whether the bacteria are there or not. And that's just a schema that um, Peter Gibson and his colleagues used to so do to work out whether it's fructose or glucose, uh, fructose or lactose at the beginning, and then you can try some dietary experiments to work out whether it's fructans or uh, polyols, or, you know, and you might need to eliminate them all, particularly if you want to get your 
gut back to square one. And so there's a whole lot of guidance for the FODMAP diet, including websites and an app. Uh, there are potential downsides of the FODMAP diet because if you remove uh, your um, ability to um, get rid of those and change your gut flora, there's a chance when you when you are exposed to FODMAPs you might get a really bad reaction. Um, low fibre also will change the, the bowel. Um, and we'll, we'll be talking about that soon. So it's, again, it wasn't meant, they say it's not meant to be a diet for healthy people. If you're healthy and don't have any problems, eat the FODMAPs. But if you've got problems, you'll have to reduce them and try to find a new balance. Uh, beta glucans are another type of um, non absorbable um, carbohydrate. Uh, they're present in um, some grains more than others. And they, they generate viscosity in both the meal and in the gut. And they do undergo fermentation in the large bowel. So they are fed on by the bacteria in the large bowel. So this is a study of another um, non-digestible um, polycarbohydrate, uh, poly, um, hydroxypropylmethylcellulose. We can't absorb it but the bacteria can eat it. Now what happens with the amount of fat in your faeces when you're on these different types of diet? If you're on a low fat diet, well of course there's low amount of fat in your faeces. If you're on a high fat diet, there'll be a high amount of fat in your faeces. Generally people only absorb 95% of what they can, they eat, all the fat they eat. The rest ends up in your faeces. But look what happens when you eat the, this non-digestible carbohydrate, suddenly we're not absorbing a lot of fat. So how did, how did that work? Remember when I said that fat growing into bacteria will break down bile salts? And you need bile salts to absorb fat. So if you feed those bacteria too much, then you won't be able to absorb fat as well. Now that's not a big big deal. I mean, maybe your poo will float in the toilet. You may not have diarrhoea. But, but there's more to it, the story. What else happens? So here are the faecal bile acids. Here are all those bile salts. They're leaking out because of this. The bacteria are, dis, are messing up our digestion. Here is the energy intake for those people. So the high fat diet has a higher energy intake. But when you're given with this fibre, there's a lower energy intake because you can't actually absorb all the fat. What about the fat in the liver? Well, the fat in the liver is less, again, because you, this is mice, so there's less fat getting to the liver. And very interestingly, with mice, when you give them fat, they will gain weight. But if you give those mice fat with this non-digestible carbohydrate, they won't gain weight. There's different ways of looking at this. Now, so what sort of people gain weight on a high fat diet? What sort of people don't gain weight on a high fat diet? There are issues regarding our bowel flora, which may have an impact on that. And then lastly, they looked at the change in the bowel flora due to this carbohydrate. And they found that the um, Bacteroides bacteria were a much higher concentration than the... So these are the bacteria that love the hydroxymethylcellulose. They were thriving. The other bacteria weren't thriving. So we're touching now on this um, the impact of carbohydrates. There's an osmotic effect, there's a hydrogen effect, but there's also effect of all of our carbs on the nature of the bacteria in our bowel. So the microbiome is a hot topic. These are some of the front pages for the last year or two in the scientific journals. It's the hottest topic. And to be honest, I only put one other um, quickly mention. There's an issue called uh, fetomaternal microchimerism, which is that in every pregnant woman, they exchange cells with the baby, 
and those cells stay with the mother for the rest of their life and those cells stay with the baby for the rest of their life. It's a whole branch of medicine that people haven't even touched upon. Most fascinating part of medicine, prob, prob, more than probably the cause of all, all autoimmune disease, possibly the cause of most allergy, and potentially one of major impact in cancer. Huge area. That's the most interesting area in medicine for me. This is the second most interesting area in medicine because, to summarise what I'm going to tell you, we don't know anything about it. We're just getting glimpses of how important this stuff is. So we know that in our skin, there are different bacteria living all over our skin, whether it's your underarms or your ears or your nose. There's different bacteria everywhere. No amount of sterilisation, anti -disin. You're not going to get rid of them. You, you, you just cause eczema. So, so there's, um, you know, there's there's 25 species in our stomach. There's thousands of different bacteria in our gut. And we had the idea, the concept that you know there were good and bad bacteria. Some things are bad to have on your skin and some things are good to have on your skin. So in the gut we're saying these are bad bacteria to have. Clostridium difficile, Campylobacter, Enterococcus. So these are good ones, E. coli, Lactobacilli. Now this, um, now just before we go any further, I keep referring to as the microbiome, this community of bacteria in our gut. The microbiome is actually to do with their genes and their molecules. It's actually, the proper term for it is the microbiota. The, the, the environment there. So the microbiome, so we've got 10 trillion cells in our bodies, we've got 100 trillion bacteria in our bodies. We've got 22,000 genes, the bacteria in our body have 8 million genes. Um, we weigh somewhere between 50 and 120 kilos those bacteria add up to about two kilos on average. And this is what they look like, it's close up. So this is actually, this is not even one cell of the intestine in the picture. These are the hairs on the top of the cell, these brown parts here. And here are the bacteria, like little worms, just living on the surface. You know, where else would you live if you're a bacteria looking for carbohydrate, but at the door, to the human body. So different bacteria. So there they are, living there. So they, and they're not all bad. We've lived with them. Every animal in the world lives with them. They do, they, they help us. They provide nutrients. They metabolize, they help us metabolize things. They can break things down that we can't break down. Then we can reap their handiwork. And they, and they're there to defend against other bacteria. If bacteria which shouldn't belong in the human body go there, they'll defend it as well as you will. So the proper way to look at that gut is like a garden. You have to look after that garden or the weeds will grow. Now, you know, you call this living. <laughs> that is their life. They live in the human body. And these are all the different bacteria that normally live in the gut. So normally if you ask any doctor which bacteria are in the gut, they'll say E. coli. Lactobacillus might be there because I've heard about yogurt and yakult. <laughs> and that's about as far as most doctors will get. But these are the bacteria. There's the different types of lactobacilli that may be in our gut. The bifidobacteria that may be in our gut. The streptococcus, E. coli, the propion. There's just as I said, thousands of them. Now this is an interesting little parcel. <laughs> it was found in an earthenware jug from medieval times. And what it gave them a chance to see, since they're looking for DNA, the bacteria were dead. They died a few hundred years ago. But the DNA was still there, and they could work out what bacteria was in a medieval poo. And they found that in medieval times there were a lot more different species compared to modern times. There was, there was a higher amount and a greater diversity of bacteria back then. 
Now, um, and these are the bacteria that they found, which are very similar. They did find some contamination there from the jar. Um, and they did find all of these protozoans, like amoebae and worms and things, which not good. And they did find all of these bacteria as well. So we don't want all of the medieval bacteria back, <laughs> but we probably want all the good ones back. So what things determine your gut community? Age, culture, inflammation, pregnancy. And this is an example of what age does. So these are the things that are known to change the bacteria in your body. Your age, where you live, if you have disease, your family, and during pregnancy, in the third trimester of pregnancy, the bacteria in the gut change completely. And so here's what, um, this is what happens from childhood. This is just a a way of showing the diversity of bacteria in the gut by looking at their mRNA, mRNA production. So it's different in country to country as well. And these things, now this article is called Mother's Knows Best. What's happening in the third trimester of pregnancy is what every mother does. It teaches its children about bacteria. And the mother in third trimester of pregnancy teaches the baby child what bacteria it's going to need to metabolise the breast milk. Um, and there's and we're learning more and more about that. So we're used to well how does how do bacteria get to the baby well they the mother can absorb those bacteria from her gut and put that bacteria in her breast milk or into the baby in utero. This is, like, like I said, we're just getting a glimpse into a world that we haven't even imagined. So here's childhood. You know, the, child, the change from eating milk to eating all of that plant material and meat is profound in terms of the bacteria in your gut. And it's the, one of the biggest uh, changes. And what I see is in the laboratory, this is what urea levels are like when kids are on breast milk and then as soon as they go into solid foods, the, the urea goes up because they're eating less poorer quality protein, if you like, compared to breast milk, which is perfect for a child. This are the triglyceride levels. So when they first start eating, they knew how to absorb all their triglycerides from the mother's milk, but as soon as they start getting exposed to other, they don't know what to do with them. They have to learn that. And part of the way of learning what to do with triglycerides is to get that gut working so that it doesn't interfere with what you want out of the triglycerides. And this is what's happening inside the child. These are the lymphocytes, the immune system. So this enormous challenge in a newborn child, not only new viruses when it meets another snotty child, but the food. Every food, every food that you eat is a foreign protein. And a child needs to work out which foreign protein is good and which foreign protein is bad. And there's an immense teaching of the immune system at that age. And people are thinking that, you know, this period in early life is the most critical period for allergy. If you don't get that immune teaching right, you'll set up the child with this immune aberration, which is allergy. Um, just a final thing, it's not only the bacteria. So the idea is that you take chemicals in your diet which the bacteria may change. Then you'd absorb these chemicals and those chemicals may do damage. So rather than this the bacteria doing damage, the chemicals you're eating are potentially damaging and the bacteria make them damaging. Now this is an interesting thing to do with Phosphatidylcholine, which is present in fermented cheese, it is also present in mature uh, meat. It's metabolised by bacteria to trimethylamine, and then our liver changes that trimethylamine to trimethylamine oxide. And the thing that's really disturbing is that people have found that the likelihood of of, of myocardial infarction, heart disease, is related to the concentration of the metabolite. 
Well, they're saying the phosphatidylcholine in the diet and the bacteria are somehow working together to cause something which is a toxin. Now this is an area of, of research. This is another really interesting area of research in animals. I don't think they've done it in humans yet. So they take the bacteria from fat mice and put them into thin mice and what happens? The thin mice get fat. There are twin mice, if you like, and some, some they make deliberately fat. They're genetically prone to obesity. So make, they make deliberately fat by eating them lots of food. And then they just, they don't change the amount of food they're eating, they just move the bacteria around. So here's the bacteria that, you know, sort of grow and don't grow in those areas. Okay, so what I really, um, there's a whole lot of things that change that bacteria flora. And whether it's the non-digestible starches we get in, in vegetables and fruit, whether it's the additives they put into fruit, they all potentially could be having this mechanistic effect. So we're going to find out more and more about this in the next five or ten years. And we have to learn about all the natural bacteria we've never been able to see before. So it will be something that develops. So that's the way of the future. Now I have to acknowledge um, my colleagues interstate, uh, Sid Sachs in Perth and um, David Kanowski and Lee Price in Sydney who will be introducing all these new uh, breath tests. And uh, just the last thing, um, uh, I did go uh, low carb, no carb as far as I could and I lost uh, 10 kilograms between the release of serial killers which motivated me to um, uh, until New Zealand, so 10 kilos in seven weeks. That was pretty amazing, really, without... without. I mean, I was a sugar addict, but... Um, and I had to test myself because my colleagues were really worried about the amount of fat I was eating. So my triglyceride levels, which have been around 2 or 3, were 0.9. Eating fat, triglycerides disappear because you learn how to metabolise them. HDL, which has never been above 1.2, 1.4. Um, cholesterol, which has always been around 6 or 7, 5.1. Saturated fat increases cholesterol, not for me. Um, LDL cholesterol, which has never been below the cutoff of 3.5, 3.4. So um, really, you know, that's 30 years worth of data and uh, and um, and so I sort of thank the paleo community as well for my newfound health. It's <laughs> <laughs>